Shalom. This is Pastor Roy Blight. I am the pastor here at Messiah House in Lake Worth, Florida. And tonight is Torah Tuesday. And of course, we're looking at this week's tour portion, which is Sav. And it's all about sitting at the Lord's table today. So we're going to get right into the, uh, the teaching. And this is an in-depth look at this subject of sitting at the Lord's table, of what it re what is required of us to sit in his presence and to understand what is going on as we sit at his table. Because this is something a lot of people presume that they know about the things about communion. They, they know about the things of the Lord and, and redemption and so forth. But this really gets into who Jesus is in our lives. And as we look at this, we realize that the Lord is happening something very deep in all of us. And this is where we're going to start. Now, when we look at this Torah portion, we, <clears throat> we want to realize that think about sitting at the Lord's table. Think about your presence and the pre your presence there at the table of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the creator of the world. And when we look at this, we have to ask ourselves some fundamental questions. We need to understand that your faith is not faith in what? Faith in your understanding. So we're looking at this. Remember, we're beginning Tzav, sitting at the Lord's table, and we're starting in the New Covenant, and we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 9. Now, in Matthew 9, Yeshua had told the man who was paralyzed, your sins are forgiven. No sacrifice was offered. There was no priest. There were no only the words of this new teacher, Jesus, who was there. And he told them that your sins are forgiven. And this really appalled those that were there, the religious people. Experts in the Torah were sitting right there. They knew it was blasphemous for a man to presume to speak as if he were God. Who did he think he was? Only God could forgive sins. And this is clearly what is spelled out in Torah. And that's the point. Yeshua's answer to them was to hear the man, to heal the man, and set him free to walk. He had, if he had the power, the anointing to do that with just a word, didn't he also have the power to forgive sins? And it should go hand in hand that they they are one and the same thing. But this is the point the Lord was trying to make to everybody. If he was able to act as someone sent from God with God speaking and moving through him. Would they not make him a priest? Would they wonder, can he show a certificate documenting his anointing as we can show ours? Can he go through man's religion and prove who he was, the, the, the accepted way that men always go through their religion? They get their certificates from their seminaries and so forth. But this is a different time. This is the Messiah in their presence. As temple attendants and teachers of the Torah, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were professional clergy. They had the role of the Levites, whose share of the inheritance was meat from the altar. It says in Numbers 18.9, You are to have the part of the most holy offerings. That is kept from the fire. From all the gifts they bring me as most holy offerings, whether the grain or sin or guilt offerings, that part belongs to you and your sons. That was the portion given to the Levites. They were the professional clergy that was appointed through the law of Moses to be the priests in Israel. And yet here comes Jesus from the tribe of Judah, and he is the one that is telling people that he is the Lord, that their sins are forgiven, and he, he's healing these people. The religious leaders began to feel threatened. Nothing like this had ever happened before. And this is a key point in all of our lives, especially as a minister. It's not about me. It's about the Lord. And Jesus is pointing everything in the proper direction toward the Lord himself. And we see this in, in Matthew 9, 10 through 17. It says, Now it happened, as Yeshua sat at the table in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Yeshua didn't go to the temple in Jerusalem to choose his followers. He chose them in Galilee, the area north of Judea, separated from the rest of the Jewish population by the home of the Samaritans. And remember, Nazareth, Nazareth was in Galilee itself. And when he chose the disciples, they were a little rough around the edges compared to the Judeans that were there at the temple. At first, there were four fishermen and a tax collector. 
the people who would associate with a tax collector were not considered pillars in the community. But Yeshua was willing to spend time with them and even eat with them. Now, Jewish society had age-old rules, and if you wanted to be a person of influence, you were expected to play by the rules. One of the rules was that a righteous person does not eat with sinners, and certainly not with tax collectors. But remember, these are man's rules. This is not what it's saying in the Torah, and you have to be able to rightly divide the word of truth, which is the word of God. There, So there <clears throat> Yeshua was, eating with tax collectors and sinners. There could be no excuse for his actions. Rules are rules, especially in the minds of these men. So they asked his disciple, his disciples why they were following someone who could be so careless. Notice that their entire, uh, their, the entire scope of their thinking was on man-made religion that had developed over the decades, and Jesus was there living according to the Torah, perfectly fulfilling the word of God, despite what men had were thinking. Matthew 9, 12 says, On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. They must have thought, he's a radical. Jehovah chose the Jewish people, gave them the law and the temple with its sacrifices, and set apart the priesthood as holy to mediate between God and the people, as well as the Levites to teach the law. So this man wants to set apart common people who, up until now, have had little regard for the law. He thinks he can make them righteous. This is what the center was in this controversy. And Jesus told them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That is right out of the Torah. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, Jesus told them. It, this goes back to the prophet Hosea, who said, for I desired mercy. This is the prophecy of Hosea in Hosea 6.6. 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. You can see that the Holy Spirit was speaking through the prophets of old, this very thing about the Torah, that God desired mercy. And he wasn't so hung up on the religious straight rules of the men, but he wanted the hearts of the people invoked. The, the Gospel of Luke says in Luke chapter 7, And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now, this is Simon the Pharisee. As he answered, he said, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt to both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said, I tell you, her sins, now this is the, the time when the, the woman who was, had been a prostitute came in and she, was, she had poured the, uh, uh, the, the oil on the feet of the Lord and she was washing it with her hair. He said, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Now notice again, Jesus had forgiven her sins because of who, what was in her heart and what she was doing. And this, this up, upright, uptight Pharisee, he was appalled because he considered himself to be a righteous man. But in fact, she had done a lot more than he did. In Matthew 9, it says, Then the disciples of John came to him. This is at another time. Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Again, the regulations of men are in the thinking of people, and they're approaching the disciples of Jesus about why aren't you as good as John the Baptist people? And Yeshua said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. It was not the appointed time for them to be fasting at this time. If it was the appointed time that God wanted them to fast, the Son of God would have told them to fast. But no, this is a celebration. The Messiah is on planet Earth. And you have to understand it's all about your relationship with the Lord, doing what he wants you to do. Now, John the Baptist ministry had been to prepare the Jewish nation for the coming of their Messiah. His message had been, repent, turn back to the ways of God, clean up your lives. Some had listened to John and believed he was a prophet sent from God. They had decided to renew their commitment to Jehovah. Others 
Now that the Messiah has come, there will be a new message. This was the point, a new empowering and a new group of disciples. John and the Pharisees would decrease, that Yeshua and the kingdom of God would increase. Yeshua continued, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they, but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. You see, this is what the Lord had put this before him as a picture of the new covenant compared to the old covenant, because the Lord was going to be breaking new ground and, and setting new standards, just as is prophesied in the old covenant. For example, in Je Jeremiah 31, the Lord said that he was going to give a new covenant to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. And this is a prophecy about what Jesus was doing even right now. Yeshua made the implication that he was wanting to share something new, a new wine. Remember, wine uh, gladdens the heart. He was bringing this new wine, the gospel, the good news to the people. Wine in Judaism symbolizes joy, celebration, and God's blessing. And this is what the Messiah was bringing. As it was then it is now, wine is used as a key component in ushering in the Shabbat each week. The day is considered to be set apart. When a cup of wine is raised and we say this blessing, blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And when this is to, to be a blessing because the presence of the Lord is there. It is now the Shabbat. And we say Shabbat Shalom to one another because the seventh day that we're celebrating here is a time of rest and it is a time of joy. And we do this with the wine that is there. Now, let's look at the messianic application of all of this a little bit about this new wine. Yeshua brought the new wine, sending the Holy Spirit, which is likened to wine, the fountain of living water. In the lives of his believers, he turned the water into wine, taking that life-giving water and allowing that water to also be the source of much joy and celebration. With the spirit of Yeshua, the vine, inside each of us as believers, we begin to do what we could not do without him. He creates fruit in us. He causes us to bear much fruit. Paul wrote to the Galatians, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. So the legalism, the legalistic ways that many people have trying to uh, live the, the, the life, trying to please the law, the law wasn't there to do that for us. The fruit of the Spirit is all of these things, and against such, there is no law. The question becomes, are you a willing vessel to carry this wonderful fruit from the Lord to the world? And this is what Jesus is getting at. You see, John preached repentance and urged the Jews to turn from their selfish, sinful ways and return to following God's commands and statutes. Some didn't recognize their need to change. Once John announced his acceptance of Yeshua, some thought listening to John and returning to God's ways with him as their rabbi, teacher, would cost them too much. They might lose their position in society, their jobs, maybe even their families. But see, they were misunderstanding the importance of who it is that they were starting to worship or was supposing to worship. Those who did notice that they had fallen away from Jehovah and that they had stopped valuing his favor, those who began to change their ways, refusing to cheat other people and reconciling themselves with others, their hearts were ready to follow Yeshua when he came. And this is what we see happening in the Gospels, and we see it happening today when someone gives their heart to the Lord. They learn to, in what it says in verse 22, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. You see, the ways of the world, the ways of the Spirit of God are two completely different things. In fact, they're opposite one another. Paul wrote to Timothy, if anyone cleanses himself from, from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Following his ways would lead them to 
into being part of a kingdom in which he would answer their prayers and provide all of their needs. And they would have an assurance of an eternity with him. And that is the payoff. They would be the new wineskins he was looking for to hold his wonderful new wine, which is the spirit of the living God, giving the word of God to everyone in the world. And this is so we see this. We're, this is about sitting at the Lord's table. And as we finish the new covenant portion, realize it comes down to your relationship with the Lord and what his presence means to you right now because this is what it will also mean to you into eternity. This is the kingdom of God. So let's look at the Torah portion for this week, Zav, which is Parashat 24, and it means command. And basically, we're looking at Leviticus uh, chapter 6 to verse to chapter 836. Now, when we look at this, this week's Parashat Zav is again discussing sacrifices. And we've been talking a lot about sacrifices the last few weeks, because this is the portion of the Torah where you see the sacrifices talked about. Why again are we reading it again? And you need to be sure you see the difference and you want to understand the difference here. Parashat Sav is specifically aimed at the priestly division of the Levites, the leaders of the community. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. What portion of the Torah are you reading? Because if you're reading it for the priests or for the common people or for another class of the Levites, it all matters. And you have to understand what is going on. We could say last week's portion in Vaikra was an instruction manual for the individuals of Israel, everyday people. And this week's is the manual for the priesthood. And that's a big difference. So we're looking at this and we're looking at how God treats his people, the priest, versus the everyday common people. But keep in mind, it opens with a command to Moses to explain to Aaron and the priesthood their duties in regard to the altar and, sacri and the sacrifices. Last week's parasha highlighted the various offerings, remember, sin, guilt, meal offerings, and peace offerings, and we discussed them at length. This week's continues discussing them, but this time from the point of view of the priests. Tzav outlines how the priest shall receive them and how they shall actually make the offerings on the altar and all that they had to do to do that. Aaron and his sons are told that they must keep the flame burning continuously, which is a direct prophecy about the burning of the Holy Spirit that is in us, that we need to keep it going and keep our relationship with the Lord alive at all times. Keep it burning, it's talking about. This is the main, this is one of the main thrusts of this entire Torah portion. And remember, when we talk about sitting at the Lord's table, you can't help but be on fire for the Lord when you're in his presence like that. So when we look at Leviticus chapter 6, it says, If a person sins and commits a trespass against Jehovah by lying to his neighbor about what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or about a pledge, or about a robbery, or if he has extorted from his neighbor, or if he has found what was lost and lies concerning it, and swears falsely in any way of these things that a man may do in which he sins, then it shall be, because he has sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore what he has stolen, or the thing which he has extorted, or what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or the lost thing which he found, or all that about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore its full value, add one-fifth more to it, and give to it whomever it belongs in the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering to Jehovah, a ram without blemish from the flock, with your valuation as a trespass offering to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him before Jehovah, and he shall be forgiven for any one of these things that he may have done in which he trespasses. It's talking about basically restitution. If you've taken something, you've stolen something, and it's not yours, you need to give it back, and you need to make up for what you, what you gave back. This is called restitution. In Matthew 5, the Lord said, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Jesus, again, is talking about getting past the sacrificial thought thing about how mentally doing this or that, and you, the relationship you have with your brother is more important than anything you could ritually do there. 
Go make it right with him if you want to be right with the Lord. And we see this, this concept given throughout the Torah. We see this concept given throughout the life, the, the gospels of Jesus and in the writings. It says, then Jehovah Ye spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his sons saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth upon the altar all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. If that light is burning within you, you're gonna you're not gonna want to lose out on that light, and you're gonna make it right with your brother and sister because you don't want the light to go out. It goes on in the Torah, and the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. The most important thing we as believers need to have going on in our lives is the presence of God in our lives, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if we venture into sin, if we have ought against our brothers, that light may be going out, and we want to make sure that that light is burning continually for us at all times. Leviticus 6.13 says, Fire shall be kept burning at the altar continually. It shall not go out. This is one of the main themes that you see concerning the priests, that they must all keep their hearts and their minds right before the Lord so that spiritually the light will not go out. It was to be an eternal flame, therefore, the ashes from the fire had to be tended to properly, and everything was done in, in decently and in order, and the Lord pronounced this and prescribed it to the, the priests of Israel, and they needed to be the ones that were above spiritually doing the, all the things that Jehovah told them to do. And it says, And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trous trousers, and he shall put on, on, on his book, and, and take up the ashes of the burnt offering, which the fire has consumed on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off, the gar off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Everything was done decently in orders, in, decently and in order so that they can keep everything right before the Lord. Yes, the fire burns the offerings that are placed upon it. But the, this fire is symbolic of much, much more that we see given to us in the new covenant by Yeshua. We need to keep the fire burning. This flame in the old covenant in the law of Moses is symbolic of the burning spirit within each one of us for the Lord. Where is your heart before the Lord? You need to understand the Lord's not interested in your going through the motions, the drudgery of your continually, continually doing this and that. He's looking at the condition of your heart. He's looking at your motivation. He's wanting to see if the flame in your heart is burning or is it just kind of flickering or is it burned out altogether? These are very important subjects before the Lord our God. This is the light that we must keep alive in our walk by continuously offering sacrifices of prayer and worship before the Lord our God. We are kings and priests in his kingdom, and we need to have the light burning continuously. We must tend to the fire that burns within our own spirits and souls, clearing away the ashes that could build up and snuff out the flame, and seeing to it that it is never extinguished, not ever, not ever. And we need to understand when we go back to the offerings we talked about last week, all of them matter. And we need to understand that these offerings before the Lord, notice how very precise they are. And notice how they had to do these things. But it's, if your heart is in it, it's going to be easy. If your heart's not in it, you're not going to worry about it too much. Then let's, we're talking about handful offerings today. It says, this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it on the altar before Jehovah. He shall take from it his handful of the fine flour of the grain offering with its oil and all the frankincense which is on the grain offering and shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma as a memorial to Jehovah. 
understand that the Lord is, is looking at your prayer life. He's looking at your heart. He's looking at what joy you have in him. And do you have joy in him at all? He knows exactly the condition of your spirit. And he wants all of us to serve, serve him with gladness and love and newness of heart because he loves us. And he wants us to understand and give us the wisdom and understanding we need to approach him and to love him the way he desires. This is what the entire sacrificial system is all about. It's why Jesus came and sacrificed his life for us, because he loved us so much. And getting back to Leviticus, it says, and the remainder of it, Aaron and his sons shall eat, talking about this grain sacrifice. With unleavened bread, it shall be eaten in a, eaten in a holy place. In the court of the tabernacle of meeting, they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy, like the sin offering and the trespass offering. Again, these offerings are most holy, the sin offering, the meal offering, and the trespass offerings. These are considered the most holy of the offerings. It says, all the males among the children of Israel, of Aaron, may eat it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings made by fire to Jehovah. Everyone who touches them must be holy. In Numbers 18, 20, it says, Then the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. And just like believers now, we are kings and priests before the Lord. We're not given a portion of land. We're given a portion of Jesus. We are kings and priests in his kingdom. Therefore, this world is not our home. But we're looking for a, a new home. We're looking for the kingdom of God. We're in this world. We're not of this world. And this is represented when you look at the inheritance that the priests were given. They were given the, the offerings of, and sacrifice, but they were not given any land. So of all the Israelites... Who would be the only ones who would not have grain or olive oil to offer Jehovah other than what he shared with them from his share? It says, and Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which they shall offer to Jehovah. Beginning on the day when he is anointed, one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a daily grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it at night. So we see that this offering that the priests gave was a spiritual sacrifice, and it must be prepared with oil. Of course, oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on, he, it says, It shall be made in a pan with oil. When it is mixed, you shall bring it in. The baked pieces of the grain offering you shall offer for a sweet aroma to Jehovah. The priest from among his sons, who is anointed in his place, shall offer it. It is a statute forever to Jehovah. It shall be wholly burned, for every grain offering for the priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. Again, this meal offering is very important. Then the sin offering for atonement to cover known and unknown sins to be made right with God. And it says, also Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and to his son saying, this is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, the sin offering shall be killed before Jehovah. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of meeting. So understand that the priests are sacrificing the same things and they're partaking of the offerings, and but their, their way of approaching it sometimes is slightly different than the normal common people. And it says, everyone who touches its flesh must be holy, speaking to the priesthood. And when its blood is sprinkled on any garment, you shall wash that on which it was sprinkled in a holy place. But the earthen vessel in it, which is boiled, shall be broken. And if it is boiled in a, in a bronze pot, it shall be both scoured and rinsed in water. All the males among the priests may eat it. It is most holy. But no sin offering from any from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned in the fire. And these are very specific uh, commandments for the priests to follow because they're at a different place than the common people, of course. Notice the danger there. Do not touch. 
and goes into also Ezekiel 44. It says in Ezekiel 44, talking about the priesthood, when they return to the outer courtyard where the people are, they must take off the clothes they wear while ministering to me. They must leave them in the sacred rooms and put on other clothes so that they do not endanger anyone by transmitting holiness to them through this clothing. You yourselves as living stones, it says in 1 Peter, are being built up a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We as priests are separate. We're, we're living stones as a king and priest in the Lord's eyes. We are, are set apart for his service. And the way we approach the things of the world are sometimes very different from the way the rest of the world is supposed to approach them. Through Yeshua, consecration and holiness are found in him and only in him. It is no longer reserved for a select family who go through special rituals to receive it. And there is power in the holiness he gives, and that is given by the power of the Holy Spirit for those who are in his service. Mark 5 says, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind. This is the woman with the issue of blood. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his, his garments. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Notice that none of the, the, the ritual uh, things mattered here. She just she knew she needed to just touch the hem of his garment. She wasn't concerned about the, how dirty she was or anything like that. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she, he, she was healed of the affliction. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says, and Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. The healing was complete. Notice that Jesus wasn't condemning her for, for breaking any of the uh, cleanliness laws and things in the Spirit. Remember, there's no condemnation to those who bear the fruit of the Spirit. And we see the sin offering and the meal offering on display. Now, in Leviticus 7, the trespass offering, it, which is all about to be cleansed of known sins or defilement. This is the, when you trespass something or someone. It says the trespass offering is like the sin offering. There is one law for them both. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. And the priest who offers anyone's burnt offering, that priest shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has offered. So now we're touching on the trespass offering. And the, then the peace offering. This is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings which he shall offer to Jehovah. If he offers it for thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, or cakes of blended flour mixed with oil. Besides the cakes, as his offering, he shall have unleavened, he shall have leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. And from it he shall offer one cake from each offering as a heave offering to Jehovah. It shall belong to the priest who sprinkles the blood of the peace offering. So that we see the priests at work here and doing their part of the offering service. And their hearts before the Lord needed to be right as well as the common people. It says the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offers his sacrifice. But on the next day, the remainder of it also may be eaten. The remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day must be burned with fire. Remember, this is the peace offerings to, to pay to pay uh, views or as to pay vows or as uh, voluntary offerings. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering is eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted, nor shall it be imputed to him. It shall be an abomination to him who offers it, and the person who eats of it shall bear guilt. So we're talking about God's law now, the imperishable law. 
Remember, within the tabernacle and later the holy temple, all the sacrifices that took place point toward immortality and incorruptibility. And this is spoken of in the New Covenant as well. The sacrifices are not about death. They are all about life. And people don't understand that. They think that the life, the death of the animal is the main important thing. No, it's the approaching the Lord God who is alive that is the important thing. All the, sac the sacrifices are not about death. They are all about life, spiritual life before the Lord. And in Leviticus, we see this profoundly talked about. The laws of sacrifice allude to the transformation from mortality to immortality and from corruption to incorruption. A person who offered a peace offering needed to eat the meat of the sacrifice within two days. One who ate as of a sacrifice from the altar on the third day or later invalidated the sacrifice. Eating of the peace offering on the third day incurred the penalty of excision. The person was to be cut off. Three days after the slaughter, the meat began to turn rancid. As an earthly reflection of the heavenly dwelling place of God, the sanctuary must shun death and mortal corruption. And remember, it's keeping the life and getting rid of the death. Through, through, though the sacrificial system requires the death of the sacrifice, it avoids the decomposition of the sacrificial meats. Better than the meat be burned than to decompose. And the same striving toward incorruptibility explains why all the sacrifices were salted. As Leviticus 2.13 says, With all your offerings you shall offer salt. Salt function, remember, as a preservative. And the same striving toward incorruptibility also explains why the construction of the tabernacle used only the resinous shatim wood. Like cedar wood, shatim resisted decay. The tabernacle and its <clears throat> the tabernacle and its services symbolize immortality. The sacrifices and the tabernacle worship point toward life, the imperishable world and the worship of the immortal one. The peace offerings allude to the master's resurrection on the third day. The master rose on the third day, as scripture says of him, you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your holy one to undergo decay. Again, the third day is the key point here, because he rose on the third day. Romans 6, 5 says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And see, it's all about the resurrection power we're to have in Jesus. Now, in this regard, the worship system of the tabernacle foreshadows our transformation in Messiah. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Present yourselves to God and those who have been brought from death to life, it says in Romans 6, 13. Now, the resurrection of the dead is foretold, in, or is foretold to us in the book of Hosea by the prophet Hosea. Hosea 6, 2 says, After two days he will revive us, on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. So when you look at the timeline of the second coming and the end, end of the world chronology, you remember that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And after 2,000 years or two days, Jesus is coming back. And we see this prophetically uh, given to us in the scriptures because this also goes back to the Levitical system and how long it would take for things to really be corruptible or incorruptible. So let's keep looking at this corruptible versus the incorruptible. Through the resurrection in Messiah, human bodies will be changed from corruptible to incorruptible. We will pass from the mortal to the immortal. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? You see, our great high priest is in the throne room making intercession for his people 
right now. When he leaves the throne room and returns from glory, when he returns to his people, the atonement will be complete. At, at time, he will share his victory over death with us. We will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. It says in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, for if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, with him, so with him, God will also bring those who have fallen asleep in Yeshua. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So here's some, here's some while we're talking about peace offerings, look what it says here. Meat that touches anything ceremonially unclean may not be eaten. It must be completely burned up. The rest of the meat may be eaten, but only by people who are ceremonially clean. If you are ceremonially clean and you eat meat from a peace offering that was presented to Jehovah, you will be cut off from the community. That's why the prof prophet Isaiah gets into this subject as well in chapter 52. Depart, depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it. Purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. And he's speaking to the priestly class here. Here's a reminder for us. It's, it goes on. Then Jehovah said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. You must never eat fat, whether from cattle, sheep, or goats. The fat of an animal found dead or torn to pieces by wild animals must never be eaten, though it may be used for any other purpose. Anyone who eats fat from an animal presented as a special gift to Jehovah will be cut off from the community. No matter where you live, you must never consume the blood of any bird or animal. Anyone who consumes blood will be cut off from the community. It says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, it, it is possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, after all that we just read in the Torah about all these offerings, we, we see that in the, the Hebrews, the writer says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. There's something else that is being pointed to. And it says in John 6, it gives the answer. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. So everything that you're seeing as far as the ceremonial rituals given after Jesus came, was crucified, and was risen from the dead, the scope of everything changed because the Holy Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. And everything we see in the law of Moses is given to us for types, shadows, and patterns of things that we are to understand in the days of living by the Spirit in the new covenant. Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And he is getting to the fact that he is the Messiah and that his sacrifice is more important than any of the other sacrifices. And this is not a literal uh, 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 means of a cannibalism at all. This is spiritual. And you partake of his body when you take communion. You partake of his blood when you remember what he has done for you on the cross. It's important that we understand these. It says in Acts 4.12, the, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And this is the point. Only the sacrifice of the Lamb of God is going to save anybody from their sins. He's the Messiah of Israel. He's the Passover Lamb. And there is salvation in no one else. And don't think that any of these other sacrifices are going to make you right before the Lord. They won't. Only your faith in the Son of God, the one who died for you, only your faith in believing in what he said is going to get you into heaven. And all of these things point to that fact. It says in, Le in Leviticus, Then Jehovah said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present a peace offering to Jehovah, bring part of it as a gift to Jehovah. Present it to Jehovah with your own hands as a special gift to Jehovah. Bring the fat of the animal together with the breast and lift up the breast as a special offering to Jehovah. So again, we're getting to very specific things that goes to the attitude of the person given the sacrifice. 
Then the priest will burn the fat on the altar, but the breast will belong to Aaron and his descendants. Remember, the priests are the one who eat of the offerings. If there's going to be anything eaten, it goes to the priests. Give the right thigh of your peace offering to the priest as a gift. The right thigh must always be given to the priest who offers the blood and the fat of the peace offering. For I have reserved the breast of the special offering and the right thigh of the sacred offering for the priests. It is the permanent right of Aaron and his descendants to share in the peace offerings brought by the people of Israel. This is their rightful share. The special gifts presented to Jehovah have been reserved for Aaron and his descendants from the time they were set apart to serve Jehovah as priests. On the day they were anointed, Jehovah commanded the Israelites to give these portions to the priests as their permanent share from generation to generation. Now, this was the rightful share of the priests. They lived to intercede. They had to be free to do this work instead of land. This portion of the sacrifices was their inheritance. This physical inheritance was their birthright. Now, the inheritance is spiritual for us. We receive it as our birthright because we are kings and priests before the Lord as followers and believers in Jesus the Messiah. That's our birthright. That's our inheritance. That's John 3, 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And we are born again as believers in Jesus. We're born again of the Spirit of the living God. Romans eight fourteen says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And it goes on in Romans 8. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This is all done by the power of the Holy Spirit that is in the believer. Uh, everything in the Torah makes sense to us because we have the wisdom and understanding from the Word of God. We have the counsel and we have the might from the Spirit of God. And we un have the understanding and the knowledge of God and the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, by His Spirit. It, that's why in Romans 8, 17, it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. So we are a kingdom of priests, and we live for Jesus, doing what Jesus wants us to do by his Spirit. And we are heirs, and we are joint heirs with Christ. Praise God. So we, these, are the, these are the offerings that we've been talking about. Now, we're going to look at now the consecration of Aaron and his sons. That's spoken of in Leviticus 8. Now, as we enter chapter 8, it is the time we've been waiting for. We've really been pointing toward this the entire Torah portion. It says, And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, the anointing oil, a bull as the sin offering, two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather all the congregation together at the doors of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water put the tunic on him, the sash and the robe, put the ephod on him, girded him with the intricately woven band of the ephod and lifted and, and tied the ephod on him. Then he put the breastplate on him and he put the urim and the thummim in the breastplate and he put the turban on his head. Also on the turban on its front, he put the golden plate, the holy crown as Jehovah had commanded Moses. So this is the, the coup de grace, this is the, the great uh, sealing of this whole affair. Also, Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them, sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, anointed the altar and all the, its utensils and the labor and its base to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Then Moses brought Aaron's sons and put tunics on them, girded them with sashes and put hats on them, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. The big to do. And he brought the bull for the sin offering. Then he brought the ram as the burnt offering. So you see, everything was done perfectly as it was prescribed by the Lord to Moses, and it was all done 
And this is the, the final part of this. And he brought the second ram, the ram of consecration. Then Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and Moses killed it. Also, he took some of its blood and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put some of the blood on the tips of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and on the big toes of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood all around on the altar. Now it says in Hebrews 9.22, <clears throat> And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So this goes all the way to the sacrifice that Jesus sacrificed for us. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. It was right there in Leviticus. We're talking about it, and it's right in front of our face. And people that are Jewish today, they have no concept of being saved by the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. And it goes on in Leviticus 8. Then he took the fat, and from the basket of unleavened bread that was before Jehovah, he took one unleavened cake, a cake of bread anointed with oil, and one wafer, and put them on the fat and on the right thigh. And he put all these in Aaron's hands and in his son's hands, and waved them as a wave offering before Jehovah. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar, on the burnt offering. Then were consecrated offerings for a sweet aroma that was an offering made by fire to Jehovah. And Moses took the breast and waved it as a wave offering before Jehovah. It was Moses part of the ram of consecration, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. You see, when you talk about the sprinkling of the blood here, when penitents brought their sacrifices to the tabernacle, the blood would be sprinkled on the altar. Blood could be placed on the four horns of the golden altar of incense for atonement as well. And on the day of atonement, the blood was placed on the mercy seat for the sins of the people. So the, sp the sprinkling of the blood is a very important aspect of these sacrifices. And it goes on. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron and his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. And he consecrated Aaron, his garments, his sons, and the garments of his sons with him. Now during the ordination service, was the only time the blood was sprinkled on a person. The sprinkling of the blood purified the priest for God's use. They became tools in his hand. They provided the, This provided them with the authority to bless and intercede for the people in his name, in the name of the Lord. And the blood was mixed with oil. This is a symbol of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit guiding us, we are more than capable of taking up our position as intercessors in service of our great priest. And we think about what Jesus said in chapter in John 20. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you, for, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withhold. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. See the, 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 the perfect uh, authority that is given by Jesus to his people who are a kingdom of priests. It is very, and it's completely in line with everything that was shown to Moses and the children of Israel. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cries out to God, asking to be avenged. The blood of Yeshua, Hamashiach, cries out to God as the Son presents it daily to his Father, and it cries Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Notice the, the exchange there. And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket of consecration offerings. As I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. In, in Leviticus 21.6 it says, They must be holy 
to their God and must not profane the name of their God because they present the offerings made to the Lord by fire. The food of their God, they are to be holy. When Aaron or his son would eat their portion of the peace offerings, he would be sharing a meat with God, in essence, a fellowshipping with him. <clears throat> As representatives of the people before God and with atonement made, he would be renewing the covenant between God and the nations. So we see the interchange here between the old covenant and the new covenant perfectly fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. It says, the Lord said, this is my, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Again, this goes right back to the old covenant. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. You see, he became sin who knew no sin. If the new priest had been a perfect man, sinless, blameless, undefiled, would all of these sacrifices for sin and trespasses been necessary for his consecration? What was God's true purpose in giving the Israelites specific instructions? Deuteronomy 8.2 says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your, your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. You see, he was training them, the children of Israel, to be obedient. He was perfecting their wills. He was perfecting everything about them to draw them into his presence. He wanted their fellowship. Deuteronomy 26, 18 says, the Lord has declared today that you are his people, his own special treasure, just as he promised, and that you must obey all his commands. That is what the Lord has had meant to do when he gave the law of, of Moses to the children of Israel, and he gave it to them in such a way that he might have fellowship with them. In Deuteronomy 26, 19, and if, you, and if you do, he will set you high above all the other nations he has made. Then you will receive praise, honor, and renown. You will be a nation that is holy to the Lord your God, just as he promised. You see, the priests did not obey and perform the temple services for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the nation. These sacrifices for consecration qualify the priests to meditate between God and man. He could offer sacrifices for his kinsmen because he had already gone through the same cleansing, not for his own sin, but to be prepared to mediate for the sins of the people. It says, and Paul wrote this exact same thought in second, to the Corinthians in the second letter. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, talking about Jesus, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the way of the gospel, to bring us into this presence, this fellowship. In Hebrews 5.8, it says, Even Yeshua had to qualify for the position of mediator. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest. Paul wrote, For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Yeshua had told John his cousin, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So speaking when John the Baptist thought that Jesus should baptize him rather than John baptizing Jesus. He did this so that, quote, the righteousness the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, unquote. For this to be true, to qualify as our mediator, Yeshua had to experience the same testing of his will for us. This was an amazing thing. The son had to question the father's will. He had to listen more to his human side for a time in order to experience our weakness. That's why it says in Hebrews 4.15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And going a little farther, it says in Matthew 26, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, 
but as you. You see, Jesus was tempted just like we are. Any part of him that was human was test, was tempted and was tested, and he passed the test wonderfully. And we see this because he was just as much human as he was God. He, he is the son of God, but he came to earth to be human as we are. Now, it says in Hebrews 10, 14, by one sacrifice, Jesus fulfilled everything. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So getting back to sitting at the, the Lord's table, sitting in his presence, dwelling in his presence, it goes on to say, and you shall not, this is back in Leviticus, and you shall not go outside the door of the tabernacle of meeting for seven days until the days of your consecration are ended. For seven days he shall consecrate you, as he has done this day, so Jehovah will, has commanded to do to make atonement for you. To be in his presence was a special thing. And look at the qualifications that had to be done in order for this to happen. It says, therefore, you shall stay at the door of the tabernacle of meeting day and night for seven days and keep the charge of Jehovah. He was committing to them the ministry of reconciliation so that you may not die. For so I have been so commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things that Jehovah had commanded by the hand of Moses. And it goes in Hebrews 10, 12, it says, For this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now, and he's watching until his enemies are made his footstool. Everything about Aaron pointed to Yeshua, appointed to Jesus, even his name. You see, the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the breastplate of the high priest. And Aharon is, was the name of Aaron, and Aaron means light bringer. And we see this. You have Aleph, which represents Abba Father. You have the He, which represents a door, new life. And you have the Resh, which is the head, the chief. These three letters point to this, this fact about Aaron, who, pointing us toward the Father, going through a new door, and seeing who is there, the head of everything, the Lord God Almighty himself. And we see the Vav represents man. Remember, Jesus is just as much man as he was God. And the Noon, talk about our creation. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Because Jesus is God. And we're talking about sitting at his table. And we're sitting in his presence. And he has the power to heal, and he also has the power to forgive sins. This is exactly where we started, and this is exactly what the Lord wants us to see here. It goes on and says, in him was life, Jesus, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Paul wrote this in order to, for us to understand that we are brand new in Jesus as believers. So we see now we have the Haftor portion of Jeremiah. And this Haftor portion in Jeremiah is very interesting as well. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and chapter 8 and the book of Malachi as well. In Jeremiah 7 it says, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. But this command I gave them, obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck that they did worse than their fathers. So in Jeremiah's day, we see that the, the children of Israel completely fell away from the law of Moses. Their hearts were not right before God, and the Lord was judging them as a result of it. Now, Isaiah had spoken of John, 
when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. This is what is said and it was fulfilled through John the Baptist. The word of Jehovah gave, the word Jehovah gave to Malachi was a scathing rebuke, rebuke up to this point. He charged them with, the, with neglecting or even divorce, divorcing their wives and taking another wife who worshiped idols, then wondering why their offering was not being accepted before God. They did not care that their wives were left with no way of supporting themselves. Their homes were corrupted with pagan ways, and their children were not godly. And the rebuke from the Lord through Malachi is very stinging indeed. And it says in Malachi 1, And they were taking defiled animals to the temple to offer for their sacrifices. Think of it. Animals that are stolen and crippled and sick are being presented as offerings before the Lord. He says, Should I accept from you such offerings as these? Asked Jehovah. It was a rhetorical question. Obviously, the answer is no. And in chapter 3, God began revealing to them his desire and his plan for them. He said, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the, me and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. You have to understand this is the coming of the Messiah. This is the coming of Jesus that is prophesied. This is three or four hundred years before the coming of the Messiah, and it is given here. It says, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Jehovah as in the days of old and, and as in former years. They had backslid, but through the Messiah they were going to come back to God. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am Jehovah, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says Jehovah of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And it goes on, something very familiar to many of us. And, and the, the Lord asks the rhetorical question, will a man rob God? Well, it's not that rhetorical. Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. They weren't giving properly before the Lord. They were cutting corners. They were doing things for convenience sake, just like we see today. And they were robbing God. And the Lord was telling them about it. He said to return for us to return to the Lord your God. They had backslidden and they needed to return to God. This is the only way to repent. Come back to the Lord your God. Malachi goes on. He says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says Jehovah of hosts. I will not open the windows. I, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soul. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says Jehovah of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says Jehovah of hosts. So we see God is looking for his remnant, the children of light. Paul wrote to the, this to the Ephesians. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And he also said, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the lord if you're going to sit at the lord's table you need to know what's pleasing to the lord because he is the lord and he's going to have things his way and what he is looking at in all of our lives is the condition of our heart our adoration our worship of him our true attitudes toward him is what he's looking at and this goes back to what the prophet isaiah said in isaiah 30:15 for thus says the Lord, God of the 
For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Also, the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Again, you do this because your heart is right before the Lord. Even them, then, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord Jehovah, Yahweh, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet will I gather others to him besides his own who are gathered. Are you going to sit at the Lord's table? Because he's looking to bring such whose hearts are right before him that he, they may sit at the Lord's table. Are you sitting at the Lord's table? And this ends our Torah portion this week, but it always comes down to everything that we see in our Torah portion is pointing us toward our relationship with the Lord. Are you hearing the voice of God? These things in the law, many people, they throw up their hands and they say, I can't understand this. This is confusing. But you have to understand, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you understand what the Lord is saying to his people, his flock, his, those of us who have separated ourselves from the world and those of us who desire to hear the voice of our Lord, it becomes very clear, it becomes pretty easy. And our devotion to him is what he is desiring. He wants your heart. And you don't serve the Lord with your head. You serve the Lord with your heart. That goes especially for the priests. Because remember, as believers in Jesus, we are a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. His own special people. That we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who we are. Praise God. Well, we'll stop right here today. Have a blessed week, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.